Okay, and welcome. My name is uh, Dan Waldvogel. I'm the membership coordinator with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. And uh, welcome to the Colorado Grain Chains Homeschool Webinar Series. Thank you for joining us today. I uh, just wanted to start with maybe a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today, uh, the easiest way to ask a question will be to join, the, um, just to ask that question in the Q&A function. That should be on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also use the chat function um, to send a message, but uh, the easiest way to get a question across is going to be in the Q&A. Um, we are recording today and uh, we'll get that up onto the Colorado Grain Chain website um, within a few days after this recording. And then you can uh, access the recording uh, on YouTube via the coloradograinchain.com uh, website. Uh, you can also learn more about uh, Colorado Grain Chain in general. And then also um, usually there's other, other benefits for members uh, to be able to access recipes and other information around these uh, homeschool sessions. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker today. Her name is Apollonia Poilen, and she operates a world-renowned three-generation uh, bakery in Paris. And uh, without further ado, I'll send it over to you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan, for your introduction. Um, and thank you, um, participants, in today's um, talk to be present here today. Um, I am greeting you from my bakery in Paris. My name is Apollonia Poilan, and I am the third generation in charge of my family's bakery. Um, so I will introduce you to this place and background so that you can understand why I have paintings and drawings behind me. Um, talk to you a little bit about how I came to be in charge of the family's business at 18 years old how my grandfather, how my father developed the family business, how I look at my uh, job 18 years in, into the job, and having a look into the future um, as well. Um, I published a book last fall um, that was a look behind the shoulder, but also offering insights into what I believe um, is a definition of bread and a way of feeding people's thoughts and um, change their look outlooks on on bread. So, um, so that's a little bit about today. Uh, there will be a Q and A uh, component, and Dan has promised me that if I get too sidetracked. Um, that he will bring me back on the on 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 things. So here we go. Um, so right now we are in the back room of number eight Rue du Cherche Midi. We're in the heart of Paris on the left bank. We're in the heart of Saint Germain des Prés, which is when my grandfather started in 1932, an area where there were lots of artists and craftsmen, um, and the bakery we're in was a bakery since the French Revolution. When my grandfather started, Paris was in the height of the small breads and white bread craze. Baguettes were becoming super in fashion. And my grandfather, to distinguish himself, started baking these big hugs of sourdough bread. And I like to describe them as big hugs of bread because if you bring your hands forward, and I'm just gonna stand up for a second, you get about the volume of bread you would get with one of my loaves in your hand. He started doing this bread because it was the bread that he knew as a child in Normandy, a bread that feeds you, uh, a bread that keeps, and those were two things that helped him gain a reputation in the neighborhood. And this explains why this room is clad with all these paintings. These paintings, drawings, eggshells and paras, this is a lithography that was printed in Montparnasse, are, were all traded, exchanged for bread at a time where the artists, the craftsmen, didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily able to pay for their rents. And their good relationship with my grandfather fostered a tradition in the Poilan family of exchanging art for a loaf. Now, I'm especially proud of this because it shows also that bread is not only about 
a food for the body, but it's also food for the mind. And you're part, more largely speaking, of a community. Um, and I think that the Colorado grain chains, reason, raison d'être, as the French would say, in and of itself is a proof that you don't have a piece of loaf if there's not a community around it. And a good way of describing this as well is the etymology of the word copain, the one with whom you share bread. Um, so that's a little bit about this room. It is usually, it's in the back room of the shop. So right in front of me, I have this tinted glass. It's not tinted, it's um, sanded glass. Um, and through it, or behind it, there's my shop. And from this, from where I'm sitting, I can see through some little um, slots in the, in, the, in the glazing, I can see little snippets of what's going on in the store. And I'm sitting where, more or less, where my grandfather used to sit to have an eye on what's going on in the bakery without being seen. I share all these things because this room, it was an office. It's the place we have breakfast with the teams, um, usually where we prepare the orders. So today I asked my teams not to crowd up the room with um, orders and things because I was going to meet with you guys. Um, but I thought it was really important for you to see that really this is, um, and excuse my French, this is a pièce à vivre. It's a room where you live and breathe and share bread. So on to me. Um, I've been um, almost 18 years into the head, at the head of this business. I took over my family's business at the age of 18 when my parents accidentally um, passed away in an accident. Um, and while I had planned on taking over the family business at some point, and clearly not at such a young age, um, I had completed my high school degree in French, France, which is the baccalauréat. Uh, I was taking a year off before I went to college and I was working in the bakehouse. And from one day to the next, um, while I was finishing my apprenticeship, uh, which I had started at the age of 16, uh, instead of going down to the bakehouse, I went up to my father's office. A uh, couple of months later, I went on to college and for four years, I went back and forth between Paris and Boston. I attended Harvard College and completed a degree in economics in 2007. And since 2007, I've been back in Paris, no homework, um, and the, the pure joy of serving my community, sharing bread, and also developing my vision of the family's business. So the family's business was started in 1932 by my grandfather. He does these big loaves of bread, he gains a reputation, and this is a neighborhood that was up and coming, and so he, was, he got international attention because he loved his craft and because he saw bread as being more than just a food. And his natural sense of sharing with the community really helped him to develop his reputation beyond the neighborhood. Um, my father took over his footsteps in the early 70s. The backstory is that my grandfather had uh, a stroke and wasn't able to work on a day-to-day -day basis in the same way as he used to. And so my father structured the family's business and developed it so that we could start delivering uh, beyond the neighborhood, retailers and restaurants alike, and then start shipping. And we've been shipping in the US bread since the 70s. Um, and that's remarkable because it's, I, when I tell I'm part of a group of tech entrepreneurs in France, and you think, what is the baker doing here? And what's, what, what always cracks me up is to think that sometimes I tell these guys, yeah, we've had a, an operating online web store since 1997 and some of them are were actually probably born at that time so it was it's this like hilarious moment where you're like right so I feel very ancient right now and and yet I am doing this like craft which surprises them as also being something that can be super techno technological 
And I think that really sums up the spirit my grandfather and my father fed. What my father realized growing up in the bakery and literally because he was 14 when he was forced into the family's business by my grandfather, he, un he slowly understood that baking was linked with just about every domain of knowledge through his encounters and through the opportunities he had of meeting craftsmen, um, perfumers that asked him to talk about what are the flavors of sourdough, of bread, through artists. And I just want, I'm gonna tilt the, the screen here so that you can see this bread chandelier, which is a reproduction of what my um, father and his team at the time made for Salvador Dali. So it's the early 70s and my father meets um, the artist a couple of years prior and he asks him different objects made out of bread until the day he asks him to make a whole bedroom made out of bread. And since that time, since 1971, we've had a bread chandelier in the back room of the bakery. I grew up in this environment, understanding that bread is connected with just about every domain of knowledge. And this to me was really what fed the obviousness that one day I would take over the family's business. So I grew up in this shop, um, learning how math, giving back change. Um, I learned precision and generosity with my grandfather. Um, and I talk a little bit about this in the book I published this fall. For me, my grandfather, um, while he wasn't able to speak, I didn't realize that that was an impairment because the, this is body language and his sense of precision went way beyond the words. Um, I remember him checking on the work I was doing in this back room, putting cookies into bags, stamping envelopes, back in the day when you needed to stamp a thing and it's not and, and these were not adhesive um, uh, stamps these were the ones that you had to wet and and put on on the envelopes and so all of these things shaped my understanding that bread is part of a community and part of an ecosystem and from grain to bread to your home this whole chain and circle needs to be fed and understood um, I am very proud to be working with millers that for some have also been working for several generations with my family, some of which have family members who are themselves uh, farmers um, and, and, and also making new connections. Like two years ago, I made this bread with um, a lady that I met and whose father knew my father. And, but we, we met through a completely different um, set of circumstances. And we realized that we had all these connections and, and desires to um, take the best of past techniques, the best of what we've received, but also understanding what's going on now in the world so that we can craft what we feel is the best um, uh, methodologies for the future. Um, so in this case, what happened is we had worked on, uh, she had um, fields and we tested these um, uh, grains and um, varieties and, and, we, and we, we saw them all in the same field and baked a whole season out of bread out of it. Um, that we wanted to share with our clients so that they could understand um, grains um, and, and the differences of essentially the grain chain that you feature on your website and that so many French people um, do not have in mind. Um, and, and that to me has been really the work that I've been pursuing um, in the past 17 to 18 years. I took over the family business um, when I was 18. I had little experience, but I had all the knowledge of my father's upbringing and grooming essentially to take over the family business. And, and this was so helpful, uh, taking over the family business with his team 
um, and bringing it um, and, you know, and working with them for virtually 18 years now. Um, so a few things that I've learned over the years and that have, in hindsight, um, developed my outlook on bread. Um, what I realized is um, bread for me has become, or the way I see it is bread is this cross section between cereal grains and fermentation. Um, and this has fed, and I understand this as where this comes into play is that when I bake bread at Poilan, we have breads of wheat, we have breads of rye, we have breads of corn, and each time they're that sole grain because, in, and this is just a byproduct of my French American background. My mom was American, my father French, and and when you say in French un pain de blé or un pain de seigle, the D E means of wheat um, versus un pain au seigle, which would be a, a bread with rye, which creates a portion or allows for a combination of wheat and rye. Um, and in hindsight, when I started working on my cornbread, and I started on this recipe because I was in my college dorm, I wanted to make a cornbread um, as a wink to my American roots, and 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 because I had tasted these corn cornbreads in the in the um, in the dining hall at Harvard, which quite frankly looked more like scones than actual cornbreads. But I always found like these recipes which called for fifty percent wheat, fifty percent corn, and this is two thousand. 2006 and I was thinking this doesn't make sense like for me if you say a cornbread it has to be a bread with 100% corn flour and this came from my French wording and apprenticeship as a baker but what later on it shaped really the way that I see my craft as that crossroads between cereal grains and fermentation when I say a bread of corn it has to be 100% corn another Another thing that I've learned through um, through the years and that has um, developed is we've always at the at the bakery we've always have this culture of um, of doing things with a, a purpose. So we we have a small line of products. Uh, we have about twelve breads um, total, um, but everything has a purpose. And I remember inventing a new product, it's a cookie spoon. Um, and I'll just show you one. Um, there's, there are these little spoon shaped cookies that you can use in a coffee. And this idea came from my conversation between my parents, which in which my father uh, or my mother said to my father, you know, it would be so nice if at the little cafe next to the bakery, um, each coffee was served with a cookie, one of our little round um, scalloped um, um, shaped um, butter cookies. Um, and, and I remember thinking, yeah, well, but what if we took it one step further and turned it into a spoon? And I can tell you, these do stand um, sugar a couple of seconds. It doesn't last for hours, but long enough that you can actually soak and then munch on it. Um, and that spirit is the spirit of retro innovation, taking the best, best of old techniques, the best of new techniques, having, being insightful about what is, what are the, what is important at this day and age to be mindful when we're creating a product, not creating something that is frivolous, but something with intent, something that has, in some ways, I guess, a sourdough, a, piece of dough from the previous batch, which really nurtures and gives an identity to the following batch. And then I also feel or have felt and something that I wanted to share um, with, um, with you guys today is that something that sets Poilin apart in my view is, and I've seen this visiting bakeries and we think about thinking about my father's words, my apprenticeship as a baker and my practice. Um, if you look for me on a typical Saturday, you'll find me downstairs because the oven is right below the bakery. 
uh, and what I've what I found is baking really is something that uses your five senses. And when my father developed um, the training program, what he wanted to do was that on day one, the apprentice would look at his maître d'apprentissage, so the person teaching them, whereas on the last days, the roles would be reversed. And I always looked at it with a, a touch of thought that this was very poetic, but this was more of an idea and a philosophy than an actual fact. But upon reflection, practice, and, and also seeing generations of bakers growing and becoming Poilan bakers, what I realize is that what, set Poilan, what sets Poilan apart in the way that we bake is that when our baker and an apprentice comes into starting to bake at Poilan, what we ask from them is to open their five senses to baking. And this is developing their eyesight to recognize that the dough is rising too fast and probably was, we forgot the salt. This is something that happened to me uh, when I was an apprentice. And to this day, I, it is my go-to example to express how when a baker has a practice, when they've developed a library of experiences, they will know how to recognize and anticipate these effects. The sound of bread coming out of the oven, and many of you know this, but there's just, it's just so wonderful and soothing to hear these loaves, these big loaves, and you, you know, when you take them out, you knock on them, make sure that they sound like a, a door and that you're knocking on, and then all of a sudden you put them on the racks, and just as they're like cooling down, then the sound comes off. And that little symphony is something that's just absolutely marvelous. And it's not only, it's for me, it's part of the climax of a work that started in the fields. It was the care that millers put into grinding the flour for yourselves. Um, and the baker that knew how to feel the dough, how to smell the fermentation, adjust what is a recipe that may sound straightforward at first, and it is, but only some skilled hands, some practice can make the difference between a baker and a baker. And this is something that I came to realize when a couple of summers ago, and at this point I'll, I will admit to you guys that it was the summer of 2013, um, and in, my, in the book that I published in the fall, I said that I kept my bread for about a week, but the reality is I kept it more like 13 days. Uh, but I kept a whole loaf of my bread fresh for over 10 days. And whereas I advertised that my bread keeps for about five days, I was just shocked that my bread would keep that long and that I would be surprised. And what it told me was that, yeah, my bread, and please don't take this pretentiously, but yeah, my bread is that good, that kept in the right set of conditions. And granted that I was near the sea, so it probably, this salted air probably helped a little bit, but the bread keeps. And that's triggered a whole, shifted a lot of my, the way that I went about understanding my craft and and helps me really understand why do I really deeply love my business. It's because I can do bread that keeps and bread that will feed me both body and mind. So today we're in Paris, it's 2020. We've just gone through about eight weeks of confinement in Paris. Um, it's the first two weeks into the first 10 days into a deconfinement moment. And I'm super proud of my teams and I wanted to share this with you. My teams throughout this pandemic have been able to deliver our clients that were open, um, serve in stores with reduced hours, our clients that were in the neighborhoods. Um, we've expanded and Andy and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. 
we've both of our bakeries have turned into essentially into general stores because I figured, well, how can I facilitate my um, my my customers? Um, day. If they're going to queue from bread at my bakery, I would like them to be able to have more than my bread, my cookies, my baker's pastries. Um, and also, it's a way of honoring the ecosystem that I work with. So, for example, I started selling eggs because my um, egg supplier was, um, um, I mean, the, the chickens were still laying eggs, they didn't care about confinement. Uh, but on the other hand, I couldn't see any eggs on the supermarket shelves. And I thought, we're, we're selling less pastry. We need less eggs. Um, the chickens are still laying eggs. Why don't I sell them? And this way, people come into the bakery and are still able to um, get more than what we normally offer. Um, and I've worked with other producers, apples, vegetables, and... And I'm super proud of my team to have stood up and been able to keep a smile um, despite these funny times. Um, I would like to turn to your questions um, and I will try and blend them in into the broader narrative about the family's bakery. If I forget anything um, or if, um, if asked the question again, um, and, um, and I guess on to questions, Dan. Wonderful. Great. Yeah, definitely welcome folks to, to use that Q&A function um, to, to ask questions. I'll, I'll just start off with one and then and get to some of the ones that are rolling in. Um, so one thing I thought of, uh, you know, your grandfather chose sourdough to differentiate the business from baguettes. And uh, we are enjoying, at least I hope, the beginning of a renaissance of a new love affair with ancient heritage grains here in Colorado and, and abroad here. Um, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who are, or any further advice for entrepreneurs who are wishing to kind of carve out a niche for their business? Um, and then perhaps that might also be, you know, a, around building relationships within that ecosystem of millers and farmers and bakers and others that you speak of, um, or maybe just even being more aware or mindful of those retro innovation opportunities that you speak of. But yeah, do you have any other advice for folks that are really trying to um, differentiate themselves? Um, thank you, Dan, for your question. Um, there's, there's several things you're talking uh, about, um, and the, the immediate example that I want to share with you is I've seen the rise in the U.S. of bakers that, and over the past one, almost two decades, um, in a way that, that's very different from, from France, and I'll come, get back to that, but something that's very similar to what I've seen in the chocolate world um, and and I want to draw that parallel because I think that it's it's very salient um, of to 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 explain like uh, a mindset that is very different in France so the way I see it is that a lot of that there is a different our bread tradition in France um, stems from we have like a bakery at every street corner and and we care so much about our breads that until not that long ago, so let's, and this is a couple of decades ago, the price of bread was, <clears throat> was edicted by, by law, like we couldn't go beyond a certain price. Um, and another thing with that was that if you were a baker in Paris, to ensure that every Parisian had bread over the summer, you couldn't take your holidays whenever you wanted. So we every year we received a pink piece of paper telling you what two weeks out of the summer you could go away to ensure that there was a bakery in the neighborhood. Um, I say this to say in France, bakeries are a really important, vital, essential business. And that's what I like about my business. Now, for my grandfather, when he started, um, he viewed his product, what he was doing, as something that would be essential to his customer's day. 
And he did something that was very different because he intrinsically believed that white flour wasn't as good and that smaller formats wouldn't keep as well. Um, and that was what his heart was and his conviction was. And I think that, so one first answer to your question is, well, what is it that you believe and what is your ethos and how does that translate in bread? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. And each country has their own sets of circumstances. And quite frankly, if I was in the mountains right now in, in, in France, in the Alps, I would want a bread, one of those big breads that were baked and that um, 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 sheep, uh, how do you call Berger? Shepherd. The shepherd, sorry, shepherd. thank you. The shepherd would take out to the mountain and like slowly work their way through so they didn't have to go up and down the mountain. Whereas if I'm by the sea and that it's super hot, you probably want these flatter breads and these smaller breads. And in fact, that parallel, if you, you can make the exact same comparison with cheese and you see the, 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 the landscape of those as well. So I would say the first thing is, what is your ethos with bread and how does that shape the grains you use, the shape and form of the breads, breads you use? And then what kind of system do you want to get into? Now, in France, we have a few millers. Um, we don't have such a great um, um, some bakers now, um, and well, we, while we, our territory is not that big and the work that the flour millers do um, is diverse enough and good enough if we look into and find the right people to talk with to get going in a quali quality way. Now, I, my understanding is that in the US, there isn't the same structure, and I think just the sheer geography of the United States serves another purpose and has given rise to another way of going about baking. And so for me, it's completely natural that people in America would mill their own grain and that this is a trend that's been much longer in the process for the French. Um, and so for that, what I'd say is the conversation you have with your millers um, is, is at the roots of how you can then develop um, a relationship with the farmers or, or go to a farmer and start working with them on milling your grain. Um, but again, the, the milling part in France is, is um, today it's not like the miller would really be the cornerstone before you go to the to, to the farmer. So bread ethos and nurturing a relationship, uh, understanding that you may in time only be able to develop um, the relationship and, and impose what you'd like, um, but something that's along a little bit like sourdough, if you, if you have to nurture it for it to really develop a personality. Oh, great. Thank you for that answer. Um, one that came in from Stephen, just asking, what are some of your favorite books on baking and uh, favorite cookbooks on the culinary side? So in other words, what are three to four volumes that live in your home, kitchen, and that you refer to often? Um, okay. So I'm going to take the question of baking, not only for bread, but more broadly speaking for, um, bread and, and cooking. Um, so bear with me. I think that when it comes to bread baking, um, I have loved, uh, the modernist cuisines, five volumes on bread baking. And that is because I like that they take a scientific approach and try and get to the nuts and bolts of what is going on. It doesn't take away any of the magic of baking. If anything, it pushes us as bakers to further understand where our craft comes from, what the traditions we've been pursuing 
how do they make sense? How do we make sense of them? And how we can get to the next level, whether it's technically or philosophically. So that would be my book. Um, I have a library of books on breads and my father collected old books, uh, a lot of historical volumes, um, under the understanding that we probably did cover a lot of the older volumes, I've been feeding more of the newer volumes on breads. And I have been amazed at the diversity of bread baking books that have been published over the past decades. I don't have anyone that I like in particular or that I bake bread from more particularly. And that's mainly because I like baking at the bakery. And so I'll my starting point will be different. But I think in baking, maybe choose a book that when you open it, as you turn the pages, you're like, oh, I want to do this bread. I want to do that bread. And if it's a book that uses sourdough, then great. If it's a bread that uses only yeasts or has a more pastry approach, then that's fine. And view those as building blocks to develop your baking practice. Um, and this is just to finish this question on a more broader note. Um, when, I, when I bake, um, I like to bake volumes of breads. Um, and I grew up in a household where we went to farmer's markets and went to some producers for different um, ingredients or, or uh, produce. And so the, the way that I love to cook is to see what I have in my fridge and then stir th things up from what I have and, and, and the moment. And so I say this because I think that in the book that I published last fall, I put a lot of what I call bread cooking recipes. So using bread as an ingredient. And when I say that I bake in, in bulk is like, I like to bake a batch of, of brioche or batch of breads so that I can have the effect of the volume. And if at home you can afford to do that, then know that what you that the possibilities with bread are infinite. You can share your bread with your neighbors, but you can also freeze them and use the bread as an ingredient, whether it's to make breadcrumbs, whether it's to make a soup thickener, whether it's to create croutons, um, or, um, or create um, the little toad in a hole brioche with the eggs inside. What I'm trying to say is that um, beyond bread baking, there's also bread cooking, and that might be another um, way of going about uh, baking and an approach. Great, thank you. And yeah, just kind of along that line too, um, there's just been a couple questions around, uh, you know, baking at home. Um, just kind of asking, you know, you mentioned baking in bulk in some ways, but also what is the, if you are going to be using like a home oven, you know, what is the, what is that sweet spot for the right size loaf? And um, is there anything you feel like you can't bake without? Uh, what is that critical? Yeah. What's, what, what do you, what's your go-to there? Okay, so the big disclaimer here is I don't like baking at home. <laughs> so when I, when I was working on my book, I tested everything at home and I was a very lazy baker. So I tried to find, and I thought, actually, maybe this is a good thing because the reality is that when we're baking at home, we may not have all the tools at hand. And so I remember um, forgetting my bread baskets. Um, the ones we use at the bakery are these wicker baskets that are covered in linen, and generations of bread batches after batch, they develop this environment which favors fermentation. So I was like, okay, well, how do I do that? So I took a colander, I took a cloth, and I put one in the other, and I tried it. And I've kept the cloth, and I ensure that it's dry so that there's nothing that's bad. But all of these little um, tricks and shortcuts or variations to work on working with a kitchen with little ingredients. Of course, a quality oven, you know, will help. 
um, having a bowl of water um, under the loaf to give it that extra luster is something that's nicer. And most of you guys know this trick. Um, when I was testing bread, I've come to enjoy using um, a cocotte um, to bake my bread and to start the baking of the bread. And that's been the trick that I recommend in my, in my book. Um, but something that I, um, that I would do as a practice as a homemaker. Um, there. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and um, we've had a couple questions around um, uh, your preferred wheat varieties. Uh, just kind of asking, yeah, what, what wheat varieties do you prefer at Kualan? And then um, are there any um, uh, region, like growing regions that you like to source your grain from either in France or within continental Europe? Mm. So a lot of the, so at the bakery, we've been, use, we've been working with the, the millers, we, we've been working for like virtually most of them for 80 years, over 80 years. Um, and the wheat varieties we use um, are, we have, back in the day when my father, grandfather started, um, it was really an exchange with the millers about the quality of the grains, of the milling that we wanted. We wanted it to be stone ground. Um, we wanted varieties of, of wheat that would sustain and make for a beautiful T80 um, uh, type of um, type of flour, so an all-purpose bread flour style, um, and and this has helped us develop a conversation, a greater conversation about what are the wheat varieties that sustain that and that that have that have su sufficient strength um, to be worked, but not that don't need um, that are not the kinds of um, grains that develop these like sort of like um, moment where they just like start out and then they just fall down. And, and so every, at every season in the fall, as we blend in the new wheat um, varieties or the, the wheats that have been harvested just that year, we slowly work them into uh, the previous year's blend because we want to make sure that we do this slowly and make sure that how, how we go about it doesn't um, create a huge like um, haywire thing. So I don't, we don't, I don't have a preferred variety and I, um, in, I, in the breads that I've baked, we've been using varieties that have been, um, that are some for them, some of them are very old. Um, some of them are newer varieties, over 50 years old. Um, and, and so I, I'm reluctant on giving you a specific name, but I remember um, my father, and, and this is not wheat, but my father being very proud one day and coming home and telling me about how he was using Petit Epotre in his, in his blend because he was just like, this is really interesting. It's working really well. And, um, and then there's a point where, where that didn't work as well. And so we phased it out. Um, and there's some varieties that have stayed. I, in France, we have this variety, Le Con Rémy, which people like a lot um, and has been one of our all stars um, in terms of varieties. But that doesn't mean that if you use a variety of a Conremi um, now um, and solely that one, it will always give that output. So it's it's about understanding uh, what that year's um, climate was and how that influenced the varieties. So on to the geography. We've been working for with our flower millers for over 80 years and we've developed through time what we now call a cahier des charges. So we really have our agenda of what we want no pesticides, no, um, like, we want them to be solidly stone ground. And those are two little things, but they come basically from the Northeast and the Southwest of, of Paris. Um, and this is um, because when my grandfather started in 1932, these were the relationships he developed 
um, but it didn't make sense to bring grain from beyond France or beyond the neighboring regions, basically. Great, yeah, thank you. And I think we've just had a, um, one other question about the uh, the millers you use, just kind of, are they, are they more just kind of the old fashioned stone millers or is it more kind of modern steel mills or do you notice much of a difference in that? Oh yeah, huge. So, so we we only use stone ground, natural natural stone, not recreated stone. Um, the really interesting thing with this is um, we have this. So at Carlin, one of we love to test new things at the bakery. So, and I have this one miller um, that I work with on the corn flour we use, and he he contends he doesn't make stone ground wheat flour. He only makes cylinder ground. Uh, flour and he says yeah but we do it at a lower temperature we sorry we do it slow um, not as fast we do it slower than normally people do and this way it doesn't heat up the grain and therefore we get the same results as the stone ground so we're like okay great let's try it let's do a test batch and even then it didn't it didn't it didn't do the job and you the, the flour was drier and, and to me it was a testimony it's like okay stone ground really is where Poilin has found its sweet spot our balance our equilibrium in our baking that doesn't mean that um, um, cylinder um, grinding doesn't work it just means that it doesn't work for us and for that purpose lovely and uh, one question about uh, your starters, do you maintain separate sourdough starters for different varieties of breads or do you use the same starter and then vary your ingredients and flours as such? Mm -hmm. Now that's an excellent question. So I should also walk you through the different process. It takes six hours to bake um, a loaf of bread at the Poilin. So we have the sourdough, we add our water, our flour, our salt to have our bread dough. We let it um, rest in the bread box um, allowing the mixer to be reused in the, in the hours to follow, which means that we can produce throughout the day, which means that we don't have any leftovers. We don't just produce one big batch and just see what we sell. We bake throughout the day. The rest one first time before it's weighed and shaped. Um, it rests the second time cradled into these wicker baskets, and then it goes into our um, wood-fired oven. There are these hundred ton heavy ovens that are of these type of bricks that suck up the heat and then release it to bake the, um, to bake the bread. So we, um, when, when we bake, we have a piece of sourdough to which we add the flour and then we get our bread dough. We keep a piece to become the sourdough of the following batch. So it's this ongoing starter since 1932 for our wheat bread. Our corn bread will have its own starter because it's 100% corn flour. So it has its corn flour starter. We have our own starter for our spice bread. Um, a couple, about 10, 15 years ago, my um, spice bread supplier, because in France, it's, it really is a different craft or at least it had been until then, um, said that they were stopping our recipe. And so we said, well, what if we ordered more volume? Would that make a difference? And they're like, no, no, we're stopping. And so I was like, okay, no more spice bread. We sell spice bread and people are interested in it. Um, and so I started developing my own starter uh, with my own blend of spices and listening to how different traditions came about um, basically going into the bread library of my uh, fathers and looking at what are the um, what are the friendly peace traditions throughout Europe and essentially the spice routes between the Italian uh, ports in which that imported spices and the Netherlands and all around it you see all these different um, spice bread recipes and formats. 
Great. And that kind of leads us right into um, the next question I was thinking of asking as well was, uh, this one comes in from, from Allie. How do you balance your commitment to maintaining a simple menu with your need and desire to innovate? You know, how important is product innovation to you and your customers and how do you kind of strike that balance? Well, in many ways, the answer is you phrased a question, it's a balance. So while we're constantly testing and trying new things, it really is the image of the iceberg where what you see in the store is the tip of the iceberg, the visible part that doesn't bread recipes. And the lower part is all of the tests and trials we do. And they may not result in a new product, but they feed our mental library and understanding of how we bake breads. Um, the way that I make an arbitrage is by deciding what purpose does it serve? Does it fit this canvas of, on one hand, bread, cookies, pastries, um, and on the other hand, it hits a flower style? Um, is, it, is it a bread of wheat? Is it a bread of rye, corn? Um, are these cookies do they fit in the oats um, box um, or the barley or the rice? And so that's, that's the way that I approach it. If it doesn't fit my matrix, um, if it doesn't fit my definition of, of bread and my ethos as head of the bakery in charge of baking breads, cookies, and baker's pastries, then that's how I get it out. Awesome. And uh, I think we have time for one more question and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to synthesize a few of these that kind of have common themes. And then also just let folks know that we'll try our best to get um, other questions that haven't been answered. Uh, answered, as, especially for those that are, you know, more around like how to um, questions when it comes to sourdough production. Um, but these are more, a little bit more broad, more in the, in the realm of, um, uh, you know, a cultural lens. Uh, so I'll just try my best to synthesize these and see if I can be somewhat clear, but kind of that, you know, what does the cultural heritage of bread mean to French general public? And then also, is there kind of a, a home bread baking tradition or is that importance really fall specifically to those local bakeries? And then kind of contrasting that with being that you've spent significant time in both the US and France, what do you view as the most significant fundamental differences between those two? Um, and then even maybe within light of the recent rise of artisan bakeries in the U S um, do you see any of that similarity or, or differences happening in, in, a, in a place like in Paris? Hmm. Um, well, we worship bread in France. Um, and I think that while the image of the French person with a piece of bread, a beret, and a glass of red wine running around may be a myth or at least an image more than an everyday reality, there is something where bread is something that is very important to the French. We legislate about bread. We discuss about bread and are, are scandalized by different, whether it's wastage or, or there's been a few years ago, there was a campaign for buying bread because they were like seeing the numbers of bread consumption go down and they're like, guys, don't forget bread on your table. And the fact that it's such an important part of our culture, of our philosophy, of the image we want to project of our country um, is, is telling of how protective we are of our craft. Um, side note, but one of the nicknames of the king and queen of France and the heir to the throne was le boulanger for the king, so the baker, la boulangère, the queen, uh, the bakeress, and the heir was le petit mitron, the apprentice. And, you know, the fact that this would be the image, it's, 
it shows that we really take this craft seriously. But I do think that there's a lot of something about the image for France, because when you think about it, throughout the world, most revolutions, and I'd like to think that it's probably all of them, are started because there's a lack of bread. Bread, whether it's the shape of the bowl of rice, a big loaf of bread, or uh, a braid, is something that feeds, is, the best, is at the roots of your diet. And something that I remember seeing this image in Le Monde, uh, which is one of the French newspapers, of Tunisian men holding these like big discs of bread um, around the Arab uh, uh, springs because they wanted bread. And, and the fact that bread was the symbol was all the most salient to me that it was something that I could recognize it was bread. It wasn't a bread that I eat, but I recognized the object. And we were using the same symbols as for the French, for the Russian Revolution. So I think bread is really this universal um, symbol and currency, um, something which my father liked to say is this essential ingredient. Home baking in France is not as prevalent as it is in the US. And I think this stems a lot from, um, we have such tight network of bakeries in France that even though there's less of them, even though you'll more easily find fresh bread in the supermarket, all of these things, it, regardless, we have a lot of bakeries and we support this system and we fed it for many, many years. Um, and so the only thing I'd say is that home baking is a fashion or is something that people come back to cyclically. Um, confinement has pushed bakers to, uh, home bakers, sorry, to um, buy flour at the bakery like they've never before. Like we've had people calling us and saying, do you sell flour? I was like, yeah, and we have for the past 85, 88 years. Um, but just that they were discovering it because they used to buy bread and now they have, were at home and they wanted to bake bread at home. Um, and I think that that's something that, and, and this is very schematic, but I think that, that one of the big differences between France and the US is there is a bakery at virtually every street corner in France. And that makes for a very different appreciation of bread. Um, please don't repeat this too much my French, French fellows, but I think that in America we have a better appreciation of artisan bread because we know that that's not the norm or it hasn't been the same norm that it was in France. And I think that that's one of the, the, the differences. I also think that in France we have such a strong tradition of creating legislation around it that we don't... Um, we have a much more rigid framework of thought on what is bread and what is not. In the US, there's much more freedom about that. Um, and I remember, and I still see in the Bread Bakers Guild's recipes, uh, um, how there's a permissiveness about mixing grains that is just not the French mentality and framework. Um, and I think that is also evocative of some of the differences between France and the U.S. Oh, well, thank you for answering such a broad question and um, and for everything today. Um, and I should ask too, just because it is of important value when it comes to the proportion of the consumer dollar. What's the? Do you have any uh, recommendations for how to access your book? Yeah. Um, so you can get my book. Um, my book is about, is an immersion into what's going on at this bakery. Um, it spans over a, a, a day and it tells you the story, but it also provides recipes of how to bake bread at home. I provided an outlook and way of going about it, which was very ground up and not, I, I wanted to get bakers in, in their kitchen with flowery water, salt, and yeah, some yeast to start with because I want them to build a confidence in their bread baking skills. 
but also using bread as an ingredient. You can find it on all of the major online distributors, um, uh, independent bookstores. Um, um, I um, toured the US um, um, last fall and I did not stop by Colorado, but Kitchen Arts and Letters in New York um, and Omnivores in um, San Francisco uh, did such an amazing job at sharing the moment that it just reminded me of how much I love um, my independent bookstores. Um, and if you can't reach them, um, a lot of them, and, and I, I know this has been the case both in France and in the US, um, will take orders and uh, will probably allow you to pick up. Um, I don't know what's the state of confinement in Colorado, but yeah. And if you feel like having a slice of my bread, you can also order my book and bread and have it shipped to your doorstep within 24 hours. Wow. Well, I know absolutely we are so grateful and so fortunate to have you speak today. And um, I know for a fact that if next time you're in the States, if you make it over to Colorado, there'd be uh, very many folks that would gladly welcome you here. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you again for joining us today. And uh, also thank everyone for tuning in and, and taking part uh, within the grain chain. And um, you can learn more and, and access this video here in the future um, at coloradograinchain.com. So thank you so much. And um, to everyone, have a great day. All right. Have a great day. And thank you very much for your time and MG, your questions. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. We're so grateful. Thank you. Bye.